So yeah, the next session is, uh, is by Wouter Mulaman from MIT and the Brown Institute. And he's gonna tell you about how you can take massive collections of Chrome HMM or Segway tracks and make sense of them. Hopefully. Thanks, Anshu. Okay, so, um, yeah, so we've just seen these two pretty cool tools that are very useful, and if you haven't used them yet, I really encourage you to uh, look at them. Um, they've been extremely useful for me to, you know, uh, take take a, you know take our our large sets of data for encode or for roadmap epigenomics and kind of make sense of them a little bit better. Um, so this is typically what we start off with, right? In the in the most in the sort of the best case scenario, we have you know, across a large number of cell types. In this case, um, this is across um, 127 different epigenomes. Um, we have, across the whole genome, we have a number of, you know, chromatin marks or epigenomic marks that we measure. And you, you end up with this sort of monstrous data cube that's not necessarily extremely useful. Um, so with these two methods, chromatin mem and segway, allow you to do is essentially to sort of summarize it in that one uh, dimension, right? So um, and you end up with, uh, with like a 2D matrix like this instead. So this is, this is in this case, uh, this is the output of chrome HMM. So for a given genomic region, across all these different cell types, you see how they behave in terms of epigenomic marks. So like uh, uh, Jason already showed you, you see a lot of green stuff here. That means it's probably transcribed. You see some red stuff for the promoter stuff. You see some yellow for enhancers, et cetera. Um, so that means that a color you see here, any given color here, corresponds to a state there in the chromatin state model, right? And this is conceptually identical between chrome HMM and, and, and uh, Segway. Um, the problem is, or this is where it becomes a little hairy, is that this is only a very small region of the genome. If you, if you know which region you're interested in, this is great. You can pull this up in the, the UCSC browser, look at your region, and see how that region varies across different cell types. But this is only, you know, less than 0.2%, 0.02% of the genome, right? So if I give this, this whole matrix to you for the whole genome, good luck. You know, where do you start? Where, where are the interesting regions? Where are the regions you might want to follow up with in downstream analyses? At the same time, this is only 100 and something cell types or, or different samples, right? I mean, it's very likely that in the very near future, uh, this is going to run into the thousands or even more, right? So. Um, the problem is that this matrix is not as small as this. It's ever expanding. So we need a better method for sort of finding regions that are of interest or regions that are surprising, if you will. So if you look at this matrix, and this is just a very small portion of it, um, you can sort of think of this also as kind of like a multiple alignment. So in this case, this is like a, an alignment of a number of uh, binding sites, a uh, number of CMYK binding sites, which, you know, consist of uh, uh, a, C, G, or T, um, and, you know, just as this is kind of an alignment of a number of sequences where you don't have A, C, G, or T, but you have, you know, yellow and green and red and whatever. So we never show a CMYK binding site as this, right? There's methods we can use to summarize this, and they're called logos. So we always show it like this. So this tells us that you know, the C is very well conserved here, and indeed there's a C everywhere, whereas, for example, here at the last position, G, C, and T, it's only G, C, and T, it's never an A, and then, you know, that, so, so we show this as a little bit less high, uh, a less high position, right, so it contains less information there. And the nice thing about these logos is that you can take into account sort of the background frequency of each of these residues, each of these nucleotides. So let's say you have a very AT-rich genome, then you can sort of take that into account. Um, now, for nucleotide-based motifs, this is not necessarily super interesting because, you know, it's going to be like between 20 and 30 percent, uh, usually for each of the nucleotides. But for these chromatin states, it's very important because if we go back, and you see that this is the genome-wide coverage of each of the chromatin states. You see that some states are pretty rare, 0.7 percent is in the active TSS state, whereas others are covering nearly 70 percent of the genome. So the nice thing about these logos is we can try and take this into account. If I see a region with a lot of white, it's less interesting to me than if I see a region with a lot of red, because red is a much more rare state than, red, than, than, than white. All right, so let's see how we can take that into account. So if I show you uh, the same, uh, so okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to take this kind of view, 
and we're going to turn it into a logo like we do for uh, an alignment of nucleotide sequences, except we're not going to use A, C, G, and T. We're going to use colors. Okay. So this is the same view as I showed you before, that 2D matrix except squashed, because I wanted to show this zoomed-in version here as well. So it's, it's over there. And now if we use this very simple principle, it's a very simple information theory transformation, where you can just turn this into essentially a, you know, a logo. It turns into something like this. And this is what we call epilogos. So imagine looking at this versus looking at this 2D matrix, right? You can now immediately see on the y-axis sort of the level of surprisal or how much information is contained at any given position. And you can see that these kind of regions are not very interesting, but there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here because this particular um, uh, combination of chromatin states at that particular position is something you would rarely uh, expect to see by random chance alone. So uh, you can look at this for the, for the whole genome for as long as you want. Uh, and you know, here in this case, it's like a silly movie where you show indeed like every color is a chromatin state and the height is sort of the level of surprisal. And you, know, you can make it even more silly by sort of having the speed of this movie sort of inversely proportional to the amount of information. So if you end up in like a boring region, like there's one coming up here, and you're gonna go a little faster. It's a super interesting region, that's why we're taking it slow, okay? <laughs> but now, look at that, okay, let's keep it. Anyway, it's just a little silly gimmick here, um, just to keep your, uh, keep your attention here after this long day of tutorials. Now, one of the reasons I'm excited about uh, presenting this today at this meeting is because many of you are the users of ENCODE data. So hopefully, uh, many of you are going to be the users of EpiLogos as well as we keep developing this. And for this, I would love to get your input so if you have a moment today, either during the talk or, you know, just do, a, just do it during this, like, deep learning tutorial, because, you know. Um, <laughs> take a moment to go here, and, uh, you know, it's a very short, like, questionnaire thing, just to uh, sort, of, sort of gauge your, your, your feeling of what kind of features for EpiLogos that I'm going to go through in the, in the coming couple minutes are sort of most interesting to you, and we can sort of, like, steer our development efforts towards those. Okay. So briefly, this is roughly how it works. It's a very, like I said, it's a very simple uh, transformation. Um, in essence, it's identical to what's being used for generating um, um, DNA sequence logos or amino acid sequence logos, but you can make it more complex as you go along. So basically what this tells you, this is sort of the 2D matrix I showed you before. This is the output, and it's basically a relative entropy transformation. And what that roughly means is that you have, uh, for any given position, so let's choose this position, you simply tally up for each of the states, in this case we're using a 15-state model, what percentage of cases is in, is in each state. So in this case, everything is red, so 100% is in state one. So that's P here, okay? And as you can see, you can sort of see this as like kind of like an observed over expected ratio, roughly, right? So we're gonna compare this, what we observe, to what we expect. And what do we expect? Well, this is just a very simple way of showing sort of the, you know, the average uh, genome-wide frequencies of each of the states. So like I said, the state number one occurs in only 0.7% of the genome, and now all of a sudden we see it in 100% of them. So that's a pretty large uh, difference. So this is indeed a very, in, a very surprising position, like you see here. It's higher than the other stuff around it, most of the other stuff around it. Um, now this is the very basic version of epilogos, right? It just doesn't, it, it, you know, it doesn't go much further than this. It just, just sort of assumes that everything is the same across all samples and across the whole genome and things like that. Um, we're also developing um, uh, uh, more complex models that take into account uh, similarities and expected co-occurrences between chromatin states, as well as similarities between uh, different samples you're using. For example, if you're building this based on, you know, 20 uh, T cell samples and one brain cell sample, then you kind of want to like weigh those samples a little differently. You don't want to put too much too much weight on the T cell uh, samples, for example. Anyway, so that's that stuff we're developing. But this is sort of the general concept for this. Um, there's also a, and, and basically it's a very simple model, this basic model, there is this prototype website out there that you can go to, um, and it allows you to sort of generate these epilogos for different sets of samples, okay? So the one I showed you before is based on all 127 roadmap uh, epigenomes, but here on this website you can, you can select any arbitrary subset of, of epigenomes. So this table you see first is kind of like a, a number of like pre-computed scenarios here. Uh, and if you hover over each of the cells, you would be able to see which epigenomes are included there. 
Um, and if you don't like any of these pre-computed samples, then you know, by all means, scroll down and you know, choose any kind of combination of, of epigenomes. Now, mind you, this takes a, a little bit of time to compute, about 10 minutes or something. Um, so you know, uh, if you are interested in, let's say, only like blood and T cell samples, then you can just uh, click the green area here, and it'll automatically select everything. Or you know, so we'll do whatever you want, but, uh, but you know, if you want, to want things to be a little bit faster than just you know, choose like any, any one of these single categories or some combinations of them or things like that. Now what happens if you do that? So let's say we have selected the whole, all the blood and T cell samples from roadmap. Then the result page looks a little like this. Um, here again, sort of the, you know, Chrome HMM, chromatin state calls, like Jason also showed you in the UCSC browser. Uh, and in this case, this is restricted to only the blood and T cell samples in roadmap. Um, so that's what you're familiar with for a small portion of the genome. Um, this is actually the WashU epigenome browser that's embedded in this website. So it just works exactly the same as the WashU epigenome browser. You can fill in uh, different coordinates or different gene names or a SNP of interest and things like that. You can use this to zoom in and out um, and slide across the genome and things like that. Now, like you already saw here, this is the epilogos version, the epilogos transformation of this set of chromatin states here. So you see that, you know, based on the genome-wide frequencies of the chromatin states, there's some regions that do not seem to be very interesting or surprising and some regions that are sort of seem to contain more information. Um, below here, there's two lists. And these sort of make it a little bit more uh, easy for you to navigate to, to jump to places in the genome that might be of interest, right? So here you see, so you're looking at this current window here. What this thing basically allows you to do is sort of uh, find some interesting stuff that's over there or over there, right? Something outside of your current view, view range. Um, it'll just jump there. So this is recomputed every time. So this is right now, we're at the current window centered here. You can jump something to the left, to the right, or things like that. Now here, on the right, you get like sort of the genome-wide global scoring regions. So if you're just interested in like finding, you know, out of all these samples, what are, you know, the top 100 most interesting regions in terms of chromatin state variability, uh, then you can look at this, and you can filter this in different ways if you're interested in specific uh, states only. Okay. So this is the very basic version of the, of the prototype website. Uh, now, we're working on a number of applications, and this is one of the reasons why I pointed you to that feedback URL, because, you know, we'd love to get your input on what you think is, is most useful. Um, so we already looked at the interactive visualization using the WashU browser. Um, one kind of cute um, application, I think, uh, it's, it's a little silly, but um, as we're growing the number of epigenomes or as we're growing the number of samples, uh, just like we have a reference genome, right, we might also want to generate at some point a reference epigenome, like what does, in general, what does the human epigenome look like, maybe. Um, in any case, in some cases, you can, you can think of uh, scenarios in which it would be useful to not show, you know, 100 tracks in a genome browser, but just get a general sense of what, what does epigenomic data look like in that region. And just like from a motif, we can derive a very simple consensus sequence. We can do the same from a, a little piece of epilogos here by just reading off sort of the most informative state as we go along. It's kind of silly, but maybe useful. Something that I think is much more interesting is comparative epigenomics. Let me take you through that for a couple of minutes. So let's say you're interested in saying, okay, I have these chromatin state calls for all these roadmap epigenomes and more than a hundred different cell types. But now I want to find in the genome, I want to find the regions that are the most different between stem cells and non-stem cells, amniotic stem cells and other cell types, right? And this is something that Epilogos is perfectly suited for. So here, this red, uh, these red rows here indicate the embryonic stem cell samples in roadmap, and we're going to combine, uh, we're going to compare this, these red rows for the whole genome to the blue rows to sort of find regions that are very different between the two groups. So what we do is we select these two subsets, we build epilogos for both of them, and then we use a statistical test for every position to sort of do a, you know, to sort of assess how different they are. And then, you know, in this case, I've conveniently also moved into, uh, into a region that's already very different uh, between the two. Um, in this case, this is an anti-proliferation gene, BTG2, and you see that indeed in embryonic stem cells that are dividing like crazy, uh, it's actually a repressed uh, region here. The gene is repressed or, or, or um, 
poised, whereas here in, in non-embryonic stem cells, you see that the gene might actually be um, active. Okay. Now, um, this is one example where you could say, well, this is a little obvious. If, if I look here, I can already sort of see that that difference is there, right? But you might want to use this a little bit more for like an exploratory data analysis. So let's say, you know, this doesn't, doesn't have to be just like a group of cell types versus another group of cell types. You could do this for any kind of arbitrary subset. So let's do it like, again, red versus uh, blue, okay? And let's see if we can figure out what kind of comparison this is. So if we run this analysis, we build epi logos for the red rows, we build epi logos for the blue rows, and we start comparing them in every position. And you can imagine that we have a plot that looks like this. Across the genome, for every chromosome, you can sort of indicate what the magnitude of difference is. Now this could be, uh, you know, minus log 10 p-value, this could be some kind of test statistic, or whatever, right? But let's just say that the higher the levels, the more significant the difference between the two groups are. So based on this, what would you say is red versus blue? Any idea? So we're doing a comparison between two groups of samples, Male versus female, I hear. Well, that seems reasonable because the vast majority of differences are in chromosome X. And if you look closely, you can see that there's this one peak here. It's like by far the highest scoring uh, difference. And it turns out that that region looks like this. Now, it might not be super clear to you that this is an interesting region just by looking at your chromatin state plot. But if you do this epilogus uh, transformation, then you see it's very clearly that there's a huge difference between the two groups. And indeed, this is uh, the exist um, locus. So just to show you that it's not just for finding differences between groups of, of samples or groups of epigenomes, it's also that the readout is very visual. It's, a, it's immediately clear to you not just that there is a difference, but also why there is a difference. Like, in terms of which chromatin states does it differ? Okay, so that's one example, that one sort of application that I, um, I, I think might be useful. Another one is um, um, spatial pattern analysis. And you can sort of think of this as a little bit like um, de novo motif finding. So let's say you have, um, let's say you do a chip seek experiment and you have a number of binding sites for your, for your, for your protein. Um, and then you go in and you select these regions of the genome and you do a de, de novo motif finding. So basically to sort of do a de novo discovery of what the motif, the binding motif of that protein might be. You can do a very similar thing in chromatin state space. Let's say you have a number of uh, regions of interest in, in your cell type of interest. Let's say you've done some kind of enhancer assay um, and you found that there is, uh, you know, these thousand regions of the genome that really seem to be, correspond to strong enhancer activity or whatever, whatever kind of experiment you're doing, TAD boundaries or I don't know. Um, what you can do then is you can take the chromatin state calls in those regions, those thousand regions, and just use like GIF sampling or EM kind of approaches to sort of find common shared patterns in there, just like you would do for the Nova motif searching. And this allows you to actually find all these like mini epi logos. Mini, like, just like you would have like a, like a sequence motif. You have like a very s small like epi logos motif there. And the cool thing about this is that it, it doesn't just allow you to find these patterns. Again, it's a very visual readout of what the underlying epigenomes look like at, the, at those positions but it also allows you to share them, and more importantly, scan unrelated cell types. So let's think about this. Let's say you do this, um, this crazy enhancer assay that costs a lot of money, and you find uh, a thousand regions that are very clear, show very clear enhancer activity in one cell type. But then you want to find other enhancers in other cell types, and you don't want to redo this assay. And assuming that there is some kind of epigenomic signature underlying these enhancer regions, you can take your found um, uh, epilogos, where you found, found spatial patterns and just scan other epigenomes. So scan other rows in your chrome HMM matrix and find very specific instances for these. Okay. This one I'm gonna skip over, but you can think of it in a similar way as you would do like, a, uh, like an evolutionary sequence analysis. You could think of, of similar ways if you would um, sort of find patterns of chromatin state changes across differentiation or during evolution. This one uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes on as well. Um, this is um, to sort of start using uh, your own data along with the data we already have in the system. 
And this sort of um, aligns well with your uh, DNA Nexus experience uh, earlier today. So the idea is that, this is one of the questions we, we sometimes get, is that if people go to the EpiLogos website, they see all these roadmap epigenomes, but they kind of go like, okay, so now how can I get my own data in there? Or how can I, you know, I have a, a bunch of T-cell samples that I would like to compare to the roadmap T-cell samples. How does that, how would that work? Um, and the tricky part of that is that um, even if we would provide, which is something we, we are working to doing, um, if, even if we would pr provide the software for doing these epilogos transformations, it's still not the same as actually comparing it to the roadmap data. Because in order to be able to do that, you need to process things, as you learned earlier today, identically in terms of like read mapping, in terms of read filtering, QC, like we did for roadmap. So here's the idea. The idea is to actually give people the option of using their own data, this is over, using their own data and putting it in our sort of DNA nexus pipeline that really mimics the processing we did for roadmap. So they throw like 10 gigabytes of their data in there. We never have actual access to their data. Uh, this all goes through DNA nexus, but the output is about a megabyte of chromatin state calls just for the whole genome for their specific sample based on the roadmap models. It'll tell you what, it'll tell you for every 200 base pair region what state it's in. And then of course, the, the dream is to sort of feed this automatically back into the EpiLogo system so that you can then, you know, just like you would select any other kind of arbitrary subset of, of, of roadmap epigenomes, you could actually select your own sample as well. Um, and this would actually allow for, you know, the first time uh, an actual integration of, uh, of, of your own data or other third party data with roadmap uh, samples. Okay. Oh. Yeah, I, there's a sum in there because uh, DNA Nexus was kind enough to uh, already sponsor uh, this kind of processing. So uh, hopefully, at least, uh, you know, if we would move, move forward with like actually rolling this out, uh, the analysis you would do through this, so actually putting your, reducing your 10 gigabytes of data to a, a megabyte of chromatin state calls would actually be free to you. To just, you know. Okay, that's, a, that's some overview of, uh, of a couple potential uses of EpiLogos. Um, so, I wouldn't say it's up to you, but you definitely have a large, uh, a large uh, uh, amount of influence in this. Um, go check out the, the website uh, if you want to, and please also, if you if you like, fill out the uh, the, the short feedback questionnaire. Uh, any kind of uh, feedback you have uh, is super helpful and appreciated. Um, thanks to uh, no, yes, thanks to uh, a lot of people. Uh, most importantly, uh, these people who are awesome, these are my, my students who started working on building, building this um, web application um, uh, prototype, and also Ting Wang and his people from the WashU browser for help with integrating it with EpiLogos, and you for you know, being here and, of course, filling out the questionnaire. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so if you're going to follow up the analysis with something like de novo motif calling, you could imagine computationally trying to do both things at the same time. Have you thought about what the advantages of, of either approach might be? Does that make sense? Right, so basically what's happening here is you're do it gonna, first going to do a phase of unsupervised learning where you learn some chromatin states. Yeah. And then maybe then you follow that up with something like a de novo motif discovery. Right. Um, but you could imagine sort of some kind of algorithm which is taking both levels of analysis into account simultaneously, and have you thought about whether that is appropriate for, like, kind of Yeah, totally, so, was? yeah, absolutely. So, um, I, I, I guess you're saying to sort of, like, build a chromatin state model, uh, sort of have it guided by finding patterns across multiple samples, across multiple, multiple regions. Yeah, so that's, I would say that's a little bit outside of the scope of this particular project. This, this really starts at chromatin state segmentations, right? It just builds on top of that. Um, I mean, I'm sure it would be interesting to sort of, you know, think of ways of training chromatin state models to find specific patterns you might be interested in, but I think that's a little bit outside of the scope of this. But it's, it could be interesting, yeah. I actually have a technical question for your yeah. 
um, um, relative entropy equation. Yeah. So at the denominator, you have QI, which is the abundance of those state calls it, throughout yeah. the genome. Right. But and when you have different model, genomes, yeah. Yeah. those percentages are not the same from yeah. genome to genome. Yeah. So what do you do? Yeah. So for the, the basic model that I showed, it's just an average across all cell types. Okay. Uh, but like average. I said, we have, we have additional models that actually take into, in which it's not, in which Q is not a vector, mm -hmm. but Q is actually a 4D array, in which we take into account all combinations of, um, uh, of samples with samples and also okay. all chromatin states with chromatin states. Mm -hmm. So then you actually uh, uh, take into account very specific uh, 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 occurrence frequencies for every every combination of, of okay. things. Yeah. So that's yep. so th so that's when I that's when I mentioned that if you would build an epilogos for you know twenty T cell samples and one brain uh, brain cell sample, you don't necessarily they're not necessarily the same background frequencies. So you want to mm -hmm. take that into account. Yeah. But we have yeah, that as well. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. All right. Let's let's thank Walter again for his awesome talk. <laughs>